Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrea Alvarez, Associate Curator and the curator of the exhibition Narciso Martinez in These Hands, De Estas Manos. Welcome to the Buffalo AKG Art Museum. I want to begin by sharing a statement regarding the land on which we now stand. The Buffalo AKG Art Museum acknowledges the land our campus resides on as the traditional home of the Seneca Onondaga. We honor the Native American members of our community who continue to bear the burden of a history of displacement as they live nearby and among us. We are grateful to live, work, and learn on this land. Thank you so much for joining us today for Voices in Contemporary Art, Narciso Martinez. This exhibition has brought many of us a lot of joy, moments of heightened awareness, and a desire to advocate for and better recognize the individuals who work America's farmlands. Today, we will first hear from Narciso Martinez about his artistic practice, and then he will be in conversation with a founding member of the local organization, Providence Farm Collective, Kamari Ali. Narciso Martinez was born in Oaxaca, Mexico, and moved to the United States at age 20. Here, he pursued his education, ultimately earning his master's in fine arts in 2018. For many years, he has also been a farm worker, which inspired him to make visible the difficult labor and onerous conditions of this profession. He renders farm worker portraits on discarded produce, produce boxes, juxtaposing their humanity with the agricultural industry the boxes represent. We are thrilled to have the exhibition Narciso Martinez from these hands, de estas manos, on view in our Hemicycle Gallery until April 22nd. Hamadi Ali is from Somalia and resettled in the United States in 2004. He too has fervently pursued his education, earning a master's degree in economics from the University at Buffalo. His passion for community development and farming led him to work with the Somali Bantu Community Organization of Buffalo and later the Somali Bantu Community Farm. Hamadi's resilience led the way to founding the Providence Farm Collective, where he currently serves as markets manager. And the Providence Farm Collective works to ensure just and equitable access to food and farmland here in Western New York, as they cultivate farmer-led and community-rooted agriculture and food systems to actualize the rights of under-resourced peoples. They have an incredible range of programs from farmers markets and incubator farms, but something in particular that I find really special is that PFC farmers grow culturally significant foods that refugees and migrants might not otherwise find in mainstream grocery stores. So I look forward to our conversation that we'll have with Narciso and Hamadi. But first, we'll hear from Narciso about the exhibition upstairs and his art practice more broadly. Narciso Martinez, From These Hands, is the artist's first East Coast Museum exhibition. And it's a celebration of an important voice, not only among Latinx artists, but among global contemporary artists. And before I turn it over to Narciso, I want to thank each and every one of you for your support and your presence today. It is really wonderful to see this crowd gather to hear more about this exhibition. So thank you. I would also like to thank the many extraordinary individuals who have made this exhibition possible. Our team here at the AKG. Thank you also to Charlie James Gallery for their generous support of this exhibition. And to Drs. Amy and Julio Alvarez Perez for their support of the exhibition. Narciso, thank you for honoring us with your presence here in Buffalo and with your exceptional body of work. So after his talk, Hamadi and I will join Narciso on the stage for the conversation. Our discussion will last roughly 30 minutes, followed by time for questions from the audience. So after Narciso does his talk, we're going to hold questions until the very end. So please join me in welcoming Narciso Martinez.
Well, hello, everybody. Um, well, thank you for being here, and thank you for letting me share a little bit of my story and my work with you all. Thank you to everyone who made this exhibition possible and for me to be here. Uh, basically, I'm going to be speaking about uh, my background, and then probably like 10 minutes. I hope it doesn't go longer. But then uh, I'll show you some images that will, that will show basically how I started working uh, since I was in school, in undergrad, and then graduate, graduate school, and then how I uh, tran transferred from oil painting to the cardboard boxes. So I was born in Oaxaca, Mexico. Oh, wait, let me put my timer on. So I was born in, in Oaxaca, Mexico, and then, like Andrea said, I came here when I was 20 years old. Um, I guess lucky for me, I really... I, I really wanted to be interested or uh, involved in the culture. Like, I wanted to know what the movies were about and the songs were about. Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> so um, I, I asked my brother if I could go to school, I, and he showed me, like, uh, a, a high school that would teach adults. Uh, so I enrolled. It was, like, really evening classes. Uh, I would start, like, at 6 to 9, 45, almost 10. But at the same time, I was working at a mechanic shop where my teach my 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 boss wouldn't let me go to school like at six because during the summers there was still daylight. So she still wanted me to work. So instead, she, she suggested I should go to a different school. So there was, um, there still is like a school for adults in downtown Los Angeles called Evans Community Adult School. So that's where I enrolled and um, they had classes all day. Um, so I started going to, uh, from six in the morning to like 12 and then I'll go to work and I'll stay until really late. But anyways, it took like forever for me to finish the program. I finished the ESL program and um, I was still not speaking English, even though I was able to uh, write sentences and paragraphs, but my speaking was not, I don't know, it wasn't coming out. So, so my teachers, uh, I, I asked my teachers if I could retake the whole program and they said no. But um, they suggested I should just keep taking classes. So the same school had a high school program for adults. And that's what I enrolled. And I took different classes. I finally, um, I first finished uh, the requirements for a GED. And then through the GED, with the addition of uh, other classes, I was able to get a high school diploma. So that was 2006. And by that time, I was already like 29, almost 30. Um, I, by this point, I feel like I fell in love with learning. Because when I was in Mexico, I only went through ninth grade. And I got kicked out a 10 for failing too many classes, more than three. So obviously I was not learning anything, but here I actually fall in love with the idea that I can actually learn. So I decided to go to a, a community college and sort of like take general classes. So I went to Los Angeles City College and um, I, I just started taking general classes and when the time came to, for me to actually pick a career, I thought I could study some kind of math or science um, I was so good at my, uh, at my in my biology classes that my teacher invited me to apply for a, for a job as a lab assistant. So unfortunately, they didn't have documents, so that was kind of disappointed. But, um, but I, I still I wanted to finish the, the program, so on, while I was taking one of the art history classes, I, I fell in love with the work of Vincent van Gogh and, and Play. And I felt like that was the moment I thought I, I wanted to learn how to paint. Because since I was a kid, I always lo loved to draw. I, I would do doodles and stuff. Uh, when I was in my 20s, I would draw for magazines. And I feel like I, feel like I always, um, I never took any formal classes. And people will sometimes would make fun of my drawings. But I think that that's what made me feel good about, about it. Like, I was good at something. And... Um, so I thought I could learn how to paint, better my drawing skills, and I didn't, I didn't need any documents to go anywhere, and I could just paint. Because I grew up in a small farming community back in Oaxaca, I thought I could go back and, and paint uh, images similar to Vincent van Gogh or Millet, like the peasants, agricultural workers, uh, who were my neighbors, my grandparents, my parents. So I talked to my counselors, we drew a map to, um, to a regular college. And I finished my Associate of Arts um, 
in 2009, right? And up to this point, I was, uh, I was paying my studies on my own. I was busing tables and loading and loading trucks and working at a produce warehouse. And, um, but in 2009, when I transferred to, um, to a regular college, I went to Cal State Long Beach. I feel like my savings were really low, right, after the first semester. And I thought I, was not gonna, I, was, I wasn't going to be able to make it. So I talked about this with my family who were working in the fields up in Washington State. And they suggested I should go work with them. Uh, they would provide me with food and shelter, and I would just save my paychecks. So that's what I did since 2009 to 2012 uh, when I received my undergraduate diploma. diploma. Um, after I finished my undergraduate program, I still felt like I was not speaking English. All my presentations, I had to like, pretty much memorize them. So from 2012 to 2015, I went back to the fields and worked for those three years. And then I really wanted to speak English. And I, all I can remember was the words of my teachers that I needed to keep taking classes. So I decided to go back to school. While I, was, while, I was, while I went back to Long Beach from Washington State, I visited my friends and I visited one of my former professors and she encouraged me to apply there for the graduate program. So I did. And it was, it was the same idea, right? So I would go every summer to Washington State and work in the fields and then go back for the semester. So I did that for three more years and I finally got my degree in 2018. Um, so now here we are. I will uh, start with the images, but first I think I'm going to steal the water. Is that okay? All right, so, see? so that's the work I was doing um, during uh, my during the undergraduate program. Like I said, I was really inspired by Vincent Van Gogh that I was actually mimicking his uh, painting style. Eventually I lost it, but uh, that's how it got me to start. I painted um, this scene uh, right at the end of my undergraduate program. Uh, it's called 99 plus one, and it, it sort of like referenced the uh, the Occupy movement that happened during 2010 and 2011. I really wanted to speak for the working class and the wealthy. Sort of like um, in, my, in my mind, the, the, the farm workers were the working class, so they are sort of like in the background. Uh, during 2012 and 2015, when I was working in the fields uh, with no school, I, was, I really didn't want to lose what I have learned in, 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 in art school. Right, so like how to create shape and how to paint and how to mix paint and the colors. So I started, I, I never stopped doing studies and it was during this period of time where I, I would uh, collect the boxes that my sister would bring from Costco and I would cut the labels out and use the quote unquote good part of the boxes and do studies. I did a bunch of them, um, this is just a sample. So when I went back to the graduate program, I thought I could, I could continue painting, right? Because the, the cardboard drawings were my, my things. So art school was oil painting. So I started doing, I continued doing oil paintings and I did, um, I did a bunch of them, trying to sort of like speak about, continue, continue speaking about the working class and the wealthy. So I had a lot, the critiques that I would have during school were uh, very technical, like uh, whether I was a good painter or not whether my figures were well proportioned or not. So I sort of like got frustrated and went back to what I loved doing when nobody was around me, right? Which was drawing on cardboard. So I collected this banana box from uh, Costco when my brother had sent me to get pizza. I took it to my studio and um, I painted this banana man. I just thought it was a banana box, so I would paint a banana man. I did not cut the, la the, the label, so the edges are. So this happened during a winter break. So when I went back to school, to class, I showed this to my class, right? Because we had to show something, and all I had was this drawing. And um, so all of a sudden, the, excuse me, all of a sudden, the, the, the critiques or the, 
the conversations around her became more about the concept instead of the, instead of the technicality. So questions about why a farm worker and why, are, why it's on, on a produce box. And I started sort of like becoming more, more open, but also my, more honest with myself, right? Like I, I was accepting that I was working in the fields, that there was, there was nothing wrong work, being a farm worker. I was sort of like trying to connect the wealthy with the, um, with the agribusiness. And all of a sudden, I feel like uh, everything clicked, right? Like uh, the, the, the working class and the wealthy sort of like got narrowed down to the farm workers and the agribusiness. So I feel like that was, uh, that was, the, that was a key moment, right? And, and I remember my, one of my teachers saying that we shouldn't get uh, excited because in art school, we experiment, right? So they didn't know how serious I was with this kind of work. So for me, that was key work. And I started collecting boxes, and I started doing portraits on boxes. Like, it was, first it was one portrait, one box, and then eventually it grew to be more complicated composition and multiple boxes. I stuck up, stacked up boxes, and, uh, and I painted around them. So this was, um, this, this piece I did, um, excuse me, I knew I wanted to, to have sort of like a sculptural thing, but I didn't know what I wanted to paint on it, but... But it was during, um, during Trump's um, campaign uh, for presidency, before he became president. So I was remembering all those negative comments about Latino or Mexican people. And I, I decided I wanted to make a piece that would uh, show the contribution of the Mexicans, so the Latino people. And because I was working in the fields, I had all these images, I decided to paint um, sort of like a, a, a sense of abundance uh, that was brought by, that was being brought by Mexicans or by Latino farm workers. So it was the first time I started sort of like experimenting with collage and um, because the boxes only have like one or two images on them, so I had to figure out how to bring more produce to the, to the image. So I cut, I, I cut more images from different boxes and collage them on these boxes. And of course, there was a problem of integration. They, were, they look separate, so I started drawing on top, of the, on top of the illustrations. It was a whole mess, but... That's, that's interesting because that's what that's the exercise we did yesterday at the, the workshop. But anyways, yeah, that's where that's how that's where I sort of like learned how to do this, and uh, the first time I sort of did it. And then I had a residency at the London Museum of Art where I created an even bigger sculpture. I had more space, and then um, it was um, this was was more inspired by the fact that I work at a producer warehouse, and uh, I remember I was in charge of. First cleaning the, uh, or sweeping the, the parking lot, but then they promoted me to sort, sort produce, and then eventually I started making orders for different grocery stores. And um, so that's where I sort of like learn or experience how the produce gets transported from one place to another, from the port that goes to the warehouses and from the warehouses to the grocery stores, right? So I collected a pallet and I collected a bunch of boxes, and the idea was sort of like the same, to show um, the contribution of the farm workers. So during one of my art history classes, I, I, I had this assignment where I had to write a paper about how much art were, how much farm workers were depicted in, um, in art during the 19, I think it was 40s or 50s. Uh, it was like a very specific time. So I didn't, I didn't see a lot of art with farm workers during that era, but I ran, I ran across these uh, illustrations that were very idyllic a very pretty uh, next to um, uh, agricultural landscapes with no farm workers around it. So I decided to sort of like compare and contrast those images with the actual farm workers. And I choose this, um, this image of this nice looking lady on my left, um, well, on, on this side, on my right, I guess, um, and compare that with actual farm workers. And when, while I was drawing it, I was thinking of all the issues that happened in the fields, like. Uh, farm workers fall from the ladders, and uh, I, I remember seeing um, just workers carrying a big load of uh, apples, and then their hoses on the ground, and they trip and they fail, and it's all like these uh, sad um, experiences, but also the pesticides, no, uh, that I remember uh, are on the, on the branches. Sometimes I remember moving the branches, and there's this thin film that comes out of it that smells really bad, and then hurts the throat and the eyes, 
So anyways, I was like thinking of all this toxicity and uh, I decided, decided to transform the nice looking lady into this skeleton. It's sort of like inspired by the, I guess it's like a toxic symbol that, I, that one see behind the, the, the cargo trucks. So this is another one example of uh, me sort of like borrowing the, the, the images from the illustrations. Um, I remember seeing this and I, I, I thought I could uh, compare that with another scene of farm workers. Uh, I, just, I just remember um, how farm workers, whenever they have lunch, they eat on the, on the grass, on the ground. And um, it's just, I, I don't know, I just, I just think it's sad and um, I don't know, it's just uh, unfortunate that these individuals have to literally sit on the ground to, to eat. Um, a lot of the times it is like uh, chemical residues on the ground. And uh, so yeah, um, a, lot, a lot of the times they don't have enough time for lunch. There are so many. Uh, when they come out, uh, they make a huge line behind the taco truck. Sometimes the one that is last gets to eat while going back to work. So I, I compare and contrast that with, um, with an image of, uh, of this uh, sort of like royalty kind of figure, she's holding a balance, uh, a broken balance. So in also comparing, contrasting the, the labels from the brands, I, I thought I could also compare and contrast the, the grocery stores, right, with the farm workers. So that's, this is sort of like a most recent uh, piece that I did. And, um, this is a ceramic tile piece called Philosophy in the Fields. I feel like this for me was very uh, important kind of because I kind of wanted to show all the work that I did, like picking asparagus and cherries and apples and also constructing or helping construct a new orchard and, and remembering how we will sit around on the ground and have lunch and, and have conversations with uh, my coworkers. I would always encourage them to go to school. There was always this thing that I, I'm too old to go to school, I'm too tired to go to school, but I would always encourage them to encourage their kids to go to school. So I did this piece also based on education. It's called uh, Generation Next. Um, these images is uh, of three of my nieces when they were like little, uh, standing on the stairwell of the trailer where they used to live and I used to stay. Uh, eventually these girls grow up and they went to college and their lives are so much better. So there's always like this question of how do I get to, to the community, right? How do I get to the farm workers? So this is sort of like, a, uh, like one of the first attempts I did back in the day when I was uh, almost about to graduate. And I, I wrapped these uh, apples with portraits of farm workers. I remember from my experience working in the grocery stores or at the uh, produce warehouse where the fanciest, the, the produce, it was better presented. So the, the most expensive produce came wrapped in a wax paper. So I sort of like mimic that and did portraits of farm workers and wrapped the apples. So people were invited to get an apple and sort of like have this connection with the farm workers. So I, I, I guess I can say I borrowed this video from uh, one of the Instagram users, Josh Vasquez. <laughs> so let's play it. So there you go. That's like sort of like, a, and, and also, um, also I did these uh, prints, uh, sort of like life size prints on vinyl, so I could um, so I could put them in the um, in the community where, where I used to work up in Washington State. I also did some vinyls for uh, the Central Valley in California, and and also there's there is uh, oh wait, I'm missing an image. Okay, anyways, so I also. Um, I guess the image that I'm missing is this, basically this piece with a group of farm workers in front of it. Uh, back when I had an exhibition in Seattle, Washington, I actually invited as many farm workers that I, that I knew or that I know to the exhibition. And it was so rewarding to see a lot of them showing up and just seeing themselves in, in, in the artwork and taking selfies with, with themselves in the art. So that was kind of cool and so like rewarding. So this piece is the, uh, is this, the third piece that I've done in this format, sort of like large, and, and this is the, the second one, which I did before the, the one that I just showed. It's also like a, in a large format. It has, uh, 
so some of the patterns of the dollar bill. And, um, and the first one that I did is actually the one here um, in, the semi, semi, in the gallery is hidden at the museum. Um, here's like a, sort of like a detail. Hopefully I have an actual image. Another detail. Oh, here it is. So, th so th this is the first one I did, uh, and it was done at the Long Beach Museum of Art right after I graduated. And um, I feel like there were some things that I wanted to experiment, but I never had a reason for it when I was in school. But since I was not in school anymore, I, I, I guess um, I thought I could experiment. Uh, I always love going, well, I didn't love going to church with my mom, but I love seeing the... <laughs> But I love, enjoy seeing the gold, the gold in the churches, like the, the gold leafing of the images, the candlelights. Sorry about that. The, the candlelights and, and the gold that would come through the windows. And I always wanted to use gold leaf, but I never had like a chance or like a reason. So for this project, I thought I could use the, I learned that the, at one point the economy was backed up by actual gold. So I thought I could use the gold leafing and sort of like represent the economy. I also borrowed some patterns from the dollar bill and, uh, and I used the gold leaf to represent that pattern. I choose as uh, a female farm worker on the center, so sort of like giving importance to the female and so sort of like honoring them and just giving, giving the history of oppression of females. And on one side, there is a group of uh, young farm workers who that's very um, common in, in, in the fields of Washington State. There are very small towns where high school kids work in the fields during the summers. And on the other side, there is a group of um, farm workers having, having a conversation. And I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much for, for listening. <laughs>
agricultural communities in other parts of the co of the world, mm -hmm. and hear their stories and and bring them to the art, you know, so that can be shared with a wider audience, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, and that's great. That's kind of perfectly brings me to my, my question for you, Hamadi. Um, as someone who, you know, from, from your life experiences has been so um, closely involved with agriculture, but sort of in a different um, angle, what was your experience like seeing the exhibition and seeing the work? Um, uh, one of the pictures that actually stood out, it, this to me uh, because at Providence Farm Collective we have a program, a lunch program, and this lunch program we have a theme we use a Swahili words, we call it Meza uh, Ya Simulizi, which literally means the table of conversation. Mm -hmm. And if you look at those uh, gentlemen sitting there, and they seem like they're having lunch, whatever the time of the day it is, whatever they're eating, but they're having a meal and they're sharing stories. And this is what we do at PFC during lunch hours. We sit down from different communities uh, and we just share stories, our backgrounds, what our experiences are. So that really stood out for me. Yeah. yeah. And I take it that, you know, there's, from what you're saying, that there are people from, from different countries and mm -hmm. coming together, you know, the shared experience now being in Western New York, but coming from different regions. I think it's similar, perhaps, to people in the field who are coming from not only Mexico, but parts of Central America. And you, you're bonding over this sort of shared, lived experience as well. All right. Um, can you share a little bit about sort of what that's, what that's like, the sort of shared experience? So um, I've met several people, and when they see me, they just say, oh, you're from Africa. Uh, Africa is a continent. <laughs> 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 I'm from Somalia. I have very different uh, experience from someone from Burundi. Mm -hmm. But at the farm, what we came to learn is the Burundians and the so-called Somali Bantus, they're very similar linguistically. Mm. Yeah, th almost word for word sometimes. You wow. sit there, they can't say anything about me. I will understand what they're saying. <laughs> but, but, before that, we didn't know it. We yeah. just thought, oh, they were Burundians, we, mm -hmm. you know, and we were Somalis, and that was it. Yeah. But linguistically, we were very close. So, and we learned that at the farm. Yeah. Cool. That's, that's funny. I, I personally, so I grew up, I'm from Ecuador, and I grew up really only speaking Spanish with my family, who was also from Ecuador. So it took until I was working in a restaurant in college to learn that there were sort of other Spanishes out there. <laughs> <laughs> and so th it, these sort of linguistic moments of uh, discovery are really interesting amongst these immigrant communities. Mm -hmm. They're really oh, always kind of joyful moments of discovery. Like, what do you call popcorn, you know? <laughs> um, so in um, a 2022 interview, Hamadi, you noted that you had been gardening for yourself but you wanted to expand that impact to the whole community. So what does that ability mean to be able to serve sort of a wider and more diverse community? So the whole idea started the very morning that I arrived in the States. <laughs> I came to the United States in 2004 with my parents. Uh, we came late at night. We were settled in a house if you're familiar with Buffalo, West Ferry is not far from here. Mm -hmm. And the next day, my parents, myself, woke up, went in the kitchen, and my parents, right away, what they were complaining, went into the fridge, looked around, and was like, oh, there is no food here. <laughs> and the kitchen was full of food. There were cereals, spaghetti, and whatnot. But to them, there was no food in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So I asked them, uh, what do you mean there's no food? There is plenty here. I know this is not what we are used to. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, okay, wait a minute. This is not food, and my dad told me, no, this is not food, and when the caseworker comes today, let her know that if this is the only food available here, I'm ready to go back where I came from. <laughs> <laughs> and we spent over a decade in a refugee camp. I didn't want to go back there. Yeah. 
So I told my wow. dad, no. And my father is a very serious guy. He, never, he doesn't joke around. What he says is what he says. In the afternoon, the caseworker comes. I explain to the caseworker, and she asks me politely, um, what is familiar food to him? And he explained it. And you couldn't find African eggplants at tops. You couldn't find amaranth at tops. So I'm like, Dad, those things are not available, but the closest thing available is this. And he made it do with what we had. Mm -hmm. I personally approached my landlord later and asked him, hey, can we use the backyard to grow some veggies? And he was a nice person. He agreed that we could farm in the backyard. And I started farming there. And the whole community now, because we came as a part of a group, the Somali Bantus, we were a persecuted group in southern Somalia. So we came as part of a group. And everyone started expressing that they wanted somewhere to farm. Yeah. They expressed that we survived off the land, and what we are eating, what we are getting is not what we are used to. We want land. Mm. So we formed the Somali Bantu community. And once we formed the organization, we started going around the city asking for land. And it took us over 10 years. My gosh. Just going around, and no one would even tell us, use this piece of land to grow what you want to grow. No. Uh, in 2017, we met a uh, well-wisher and asked us, what do uh, you guys want? Mm. What does your community want? How can I help? And that was the f on top of the agenda, I put land access. And that person is here with us today. Mm. It's our executive director, uh, Christine Wise. Mm. And she took us to her house in East Aurora, had a meeting. And two weeks later, we had farmland in East Aurora where the Somali Bantu community farms started. Mm. Yeah. And when the Somali Bantu community farms started there, word got around. Other immigrant communities found out that the Bantus had land. Mm. And how do we get this piece of the pie? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> And we were like, okay, we are not going to be stingy. Everybody's welcome. Mm -hmm. But you know, as there, when people come together to share resources, there will be conflicts. So the idea came that, okay, there needs to be an organization. Yeah. You know, overseeing all these communities. And that's how Providence Farm Collective came into being. And once the organization was formed, again, the immigrant communities were like, okay, this shouldn't end with us. We need a provide, to be able to provide food to the entire communities that don't farm here, mm. that meaning Western New York. Uh, to now, we have the uh, Providence Farmers uh, Market on the west side. Uh, we also have an aggregation program where PFC buys mm. food from the farmers and then we donate to various food pantries around Buffalo, wow. especially the underserved communities on the east side, west side, and riverside. Yes. That's great. I'm, I think um, the impact of this organization is so vast across this region, and it's something that m many of us probably haven't heard of or engaged with, so it's so great to, to learn more about it. Um, and I also, in the, some of the, what you were saying, you're making me think also about the experiences that Narciso, you and your family may have had. You talk a lot about um, Santa Cruz Papalutla, like the town that you came from in Oaxaca as being an agrarian town. Um, and then, you know, you've lived in LA in, in that region for or Long Beach for most of the time that you've been in the United States. So, you know, similarly, leaving a really sort of rural place and moving to a, a largely urban place, um, what is that? experience like for you? I mean, I think a lot of it has manifested in the incredible work that you make, but as far as um, ha has your family sort of spoken about that or does that resonate with you? Well, I feel like the, the biggest difference is uh, the com commercialization of, of yeah. uh, the products that, that we produce, really. You know? uh, in, in my hometown, everyone has their own pieces of land and they grow wherever they can to survive, like mostly corn, beans, and squash, right? That's mm. a trio. Uh, we all plant those three things that let us through the year. Um, we, well, they're usually at the mercy of the season because there's no 
maybe now there is. I came 25 years ago. But when I was there, I remember no one having like a, an irrigation system or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there was a well or two in the whole town. Um, we were just at the mercy of the season. If it was a good rain, we would have good crops. If there wasn't, then, you know, we had to struggle. Um, well, here is like the total opposite, right? Like, right. Um, if there's no good crops here, if uh, I feel like the companies make anything to have good crops, right? I work in an inside orchard where I sort of like oversaw the application of the chemicals to the to the plants, and it's just crazy how there is one chemical for growth, there is one chemical for production, mm -hmm. there is even um, yeah, there's it was it was crazy, you know, and um, and it's all for, for profit, no? Yeah. Um, many times I feel like people don't even enjoy the pro the produce the products because they get exported, right? Right. So yeah, it, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. So since coming to the U.S., you've both found yourselves and in, um, in roles as advocates and promoting awareness of the realities of commercial farm working, in your case, Narciso, and um, promoting <coughs> sort of grassroots ag agricultural engagement and self-sufficiency with you, Hamadi. Um, and I also know that since arriving to the US, um, we've talked about this, that you've each pursued multiple degrees of, in your education. So um, earning ultimately master's level degrees in each of your respective fields. So can you speak, both of you, to the importance of education in your life and in your role now as advocates? Well, what I, I feel like, um, well, it, in my case, it gave me confidence, no? I, I feel like uh, at one point in, um, at one point in my life, uh, it clicked that I that I was actually capable of learning because when I was growing up, there were no role models, right? My parents only went through third and fourth grade. Only two of my siblings went to high school. And um, so yeah, in my hometown, there was, pro for my generation, probably one or two finished a career. Um, it was very difficult. And, and I came to the US and all the rhetoric about uh, indigenous people, right? Like, we are not capable of learning, we're different, blah, blah, blah. But, but actually, my teachers taught me otherwise. So at one point, I was excited about learning, and I made it my goal to have a college degree. It doesn't, it, I didn't know what I was going to study. Mm -hmm. I just said, I want a, I want a college degree. Yeah. And when I, when I finished my undergrad degree, I feel like I didn't, I didn't do the, um, what is it called, the graduation ceremony, oh, you yeah. know? Um, and I, I just said it was all about money. But when I graduate, graduate when I finished my graduate program, I, I, at that point, I already had more experience uh, getting to know uh, my coworkers in the fields and visiting their families. And I, I met a, a bunch of their kids, and I also realized that I have nephews and nieces, and that they needed a role model, right? Mm. So for my graduate um, graduation, I actually had my my graduation attire, and I actually walked. But it was for that reason. Yeah. And I think uh, for me, and. I feel like for me, an education has given me like confidence to speak. Um, literally, the way I'm speaking right now, um, I feel like it gives courage to demand better payment, where better working conditions. No. Yeah. How about you, Kamani? Yeah, as uh, Narciso uh, mentioned, education empowers. You know, again, I go back to when I came. My community gathered and formed the Somali Bantu community organization. None of us had a college degree. Uh, I was actually the only one who, who went through high school in, Africa, um, in Kenya, finished high school. Mm. And my English, though I have an accent now, was way off back then. <laughs> and every office or organization that we approached, they will ask what were our qualifications. And the moment they realized none of us in the group had a college degree, and no one wanted to deal with us. There wasn't yeah. trust. Right. And once I realized that, I was like, okay, wait a minute. What should I do here? Right away, I went to ECC, enrolled at ECC, and started classes there. And I'm 
once I started classes there, I got my associates, came to Buff State here, got my bachelors, start running the organization, mm. and people started trusting us. And funny mm -hmm. enough, it was within the colleges that we start forming relationships. The professors started helping yeah. us, seeing that, okay, he's willing to do this, I'm gonna help him. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is, education is very crucial, especially if you are dealing with underserved uh, and communities who have faced a lot of inequ inequity and injustices, you have to understand, you have to know the world, yeah. and you have to know who you are dealing with, and your expressions have to be respectful and representative at the same time. Mm -hmm. So I think education is a pathway to those avenues. Yeah, yeah. that's incredible, thank you. Um, so thinking about sort of the, the pathways and the, the future that we think about when we talk about education and where, where it can take all of us and, um, Narcisa, so you and I were talking recently when we were talking about the Providence Farm Collective and this conversation. Um, you said that the organizations like PFC, is, it, it's kind of like the model conclusion for how agriculture maybe could and should look like, you know, in maybe an adjust and equitable world that we would all love to, to inhabit. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about like, what you would think it would mean for the farm workers, your, your co-workers, to move away from commercial farming into models more like what we've heard about with PFC? And then um, Hamadi, you know, how do you think we can get to a, a place like that, if that's something that you think is possible? Well, I... Um well, for one thing, um, okay, I'm, I'm gonna start from this. Like, the, the reason I started that conversation is because I, I had a friend also, Juan Santiago, I don't know if you know him, but he also runs um, sort of like, a, um, like an organization called Salt of the Earth, um, and they sort of like organize tours to, back in Madera, California, they organize tours to go to different orchards, orchards that are not um, like big commercial orchards, right? They are uh, collectives. Sometimes they are um, family-owned mm -hmm. uh, plots where they where they um, produce uh, different different crops, right? A year. And he was telling me how um, how big agri agribusiness they usually focus on one thing. He calls it monoculture or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, where they try to produce one product as much as possible, many times to be um, exported, right? Yeah. Whereas small, small family farms or organizations like yours, they create different crops that can be, um, can be uh, distributed among the community, mm -hmm. right? Um, he mentioned about how farm workers have better um, quality kind of work, um, I guess time, you know, yeah. they're not as... as Work-life balance. <laughs> like pushed, you know, like yeah. when, when we work for big companies, it's like literally on the clock, like we just have to go on and on and on. And like, yeah. as soon as the time comes for our break, we're, we're under the tree. And as soon as time go, starts again for us to work, we have to go be back in the trees again. So whereas the, the small farms, I feel like they will work differently. Like you, you were saying, even uh, this uh, idea of having a conversation during lunchtime. So I don't know. I guess just one example. Yeah. 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 And do you, do you see sort of a, a possibility for a future like that where more of these collectives exist, where people are buying their produce? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the current food system, not to fault it, but it, it is broken. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I, well, I don't have the complete solution, but to start, you know, folks need to have conversation. And to have the conversation, you have to bring the farm workers and all the stakeholders at the table to yeah. have the conversation. Uh, for example, at PFC, and I'm going to read this off my paper, and uh, for example, for uh, PFC, we have the four pillars. And these four pillars are equity, this is access to opportunities, resources, and empowerment. 
Uh, we also have grassroots. Uh, this is having a seat at the table, listening to folks, you know, and we have inclusiveness. This is respecting people, the farm workers, the farm, farm owners, and whoever is involved. And also education, as we just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, once folks get education, this empowers them to either express them and to develop other forms of whatever business they want to go to. Mm -hmm. So I believe all this will lead to fixing the system, but also we need to be open to new models. Mm -hmm. You know, know what we eat, what is grown, who grows it. Yeah. A lot of folks seem to not care. As long as you can just walk into the grocery store and buy it, you buy it. You don't know if somebody was paid in pennies, worked eight hours a week, no one cares. And if we keep that mindset, then nothing will get fixed. Yeah. Um, that, again, leads me to my next question, which is, I think, one of the things that I've heard a lot since this exhibition opened is, um, you know, how, to, how can they, the public, how can all of us get involved with um, helping be advocates and be, far, be um, more vocal and also in our own ways in how we purchase our food, how can we make change? I think for me, just having worked, Narciso worked with you on this exhibition and curating this exhibition, I, I don't experience grocery shopping and food and going to restaurants in the same way. And I hope that I never will. I hope that this lasts, you know, that this exhibition that's only on view for a short time has this lasting impact, not just for me, but for, for all of us. Um, so I would love sort of to, to close it out if you can each share a little bit about what you think all of us can do to carry the, the message of also becoming advocates for um, America's farm workers. Well, documents. Yeah. I, throughout my experience in the fields, I learned that a lot of farm workers don't have documents, including myself. And I feel like that's uh, kind of sad because, I don't know, I feel like companies take advantage of, yeah. of farm workers. Mm -hmm. um, with no documents, they can't say, I want to go to college, I want to get a loan for a house. Many times they can't drive because they don't, can't apply for driver's licenses. Pretty much they are at the mercy of whatever they can get something to eat. Mm -hmm. So I guess the help will be at this point, I would say at a policy level. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, I don't know, get more involved with pol politics in, in this case. Call no, I don't senators. know if there is a policy that will help farm workers or people who don't have documents to get documents. I feel like that's, that's, that's my say, you know, like mm -hmm. based on my experience. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what I think is, as I said earlier, if you want to get involved, you can basically start with knowing what you eat, who grew it, and be willing to pay worth for your food, the food that yeah. you're buying. Supporting organizations like PFC that supports uh, farmers, uh, I think that will be uh, very helpful. And if you want to support PFC, you can visit providencefarmcollective.org and also UB Food Lab, if you just put on your Google search, UB Food Lab, they are very involved in the food systems mm -hmm. in Western New York. So you can start there and move on. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you all so much. Um, thank you, Narciso and Hamadi, for joining me in this really important conversation. Um, I know I'm, I'm going to carry the messages not only from the exhibition, from, but from also from today with me for long after. Um, just as a reminder, the exhibition is on view until April 22nd, so please come back and see it again with new, fresh eyes. And um, thank you all very much for your time today. Get home safe and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.